uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 tonight. Pray if you would for uh, Carney's. Uh, Miss Jovi, uh, their little girl, has had a fever this weekend, so that's where Brother Josh is. He and I always joke about, uh, he'll ask me usually, do you want Rachel there or me there? And he knows the answer to that, so he stays home. So I uh, appreciate uh, he always gives me a hard time about it. I see who you really love or need or whatever. So uh, 1 Samuel 17, and let's begin in verse number 20. We're going to look at this chapter together. One of my favorite uh, stories in Scripture is 1 Samuel 17, and uh, looking at the story of David and Goliath, as well as God. Don't forget his name in this story as well, who really it's all about. We often talk about the story of David and Goliath, but it's really a story about God, and so we're going to talk about that and how we can lead in those areas God gives us. Let's stand together if you're able to do so for a moment. 1 Samuel 17, and let's begin in verse 20. We'll read down through verse 24 and then skip down and read our key verse tonight, which is verse 29. 1 Samuel 17, let's begin in verse 20. <clears throat> and David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to battle and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, notice this, Imagine you haven't heard this story. Just let these verses wash over you. Behold, uh, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Uh, referenced earlier, back at the beginning of the chapter. Verse 24, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. The men of Israel, uh, let's go down to verse 29, we'll come back to that verse in just a moment. And David said, what have I done? Notice this question, is there not a cause? And so tonight for a few minutes we want to look at this subject, the cause of influence, the cause of influence. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you tonight for the joy it is to be here. Thank you for these that are here, um, Lord, who <clears throat> value uh, gathering together under your word and allowing your spirit to... Um, teach us to apply your truth and to transform us uh, more fully into the image of Christ. I pray that would happen again tonight. I pray, Lord, it would happen not just to us, but through us to those that we influence. Help us, Lord, tonight to see the focus, the tenacious faith and focus of David. And Lord, to stack up to it our own leadership where it falls short or where it needs to grow. And Lord, to uh, develop more of a purpose, more of a cause in our leadership. And uh, Lord, I pray it would transform us, it would impact those that we lead and serve, and just help us tonight as we listen to your word and to your spirit. Bless this time in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. The cause of influence. The other day I saw a picture I thought was hilarious. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody where you're like, where did they get that outfit? They didn't get the whole outfit at the same store because it clashes or it doesn't match. My mother would describe it as a loud outfit. That's the word she always would use. We would laugh about that as kids. It's a loud outfit. But this picture I thought was hilarious. Not just the picture, but the caption. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a guy with camo pants on and then a, you know, like those like uh, safety vests to help you see somebody. Somebody said in response to this, does this man want to be seen or not? He's got camo on, but he's got his hazard vest on. Can I just say as we begin this evening, leadership influence is not for those who want to hide. It's not for those who want to blend in. It's for those who want to, in a marked way, stand, stick out so that God can do something in their life. And not in a weird way, not in a strange way, but in a distinct way for the glory and honor of God. And in our day, too many are trying to lead from a position of safety, from a position of blending in where God has called them to be distinct. Now, can I just say this as we begin? A key statement, you may want to jot this down in your notes. A position of influence is not the end, but the means to a divine cause. A position of influence is not the end, but the means to a divine cause. So that premise that a position of influence is not the end, but it is the means to a divine cause means that the, leader sh the leader's focus is not on his position or her position, but on the purpose for which God has called them to lead. Um, in your parenting, 
It's not, I am the parent, and you will make my life easy as the parent in this parental child relationship, even into adulthood. It's about how you can serve me or what you can do for me. As a parent, there's a purpose in this relationship. And as the leader, I'm always trying to remind those that I influence of that purpose, remind myself, remind them so that the relationship accomplishes God's purpose. Same thing's true in the church. Too many churches exist for the benefit and aggrandization, if you will, or promotion of the people that lead it. Instead of remembering that our purpose is bigger than you and me, it's bigger than what we can get out of this relationship is about God's divine cause. And so in the text this evening, we see David, who we had just talked about, he's in the court of Saul, and now this new engagement or battle with the Philistines begins to ramp up in the Valley of Elah. Uh, this would be just a few miles southwest of Jerusalem, as described earlier in the chapter. And basically what happened is they get together as armies, and they realize that, that this battle is going to be devastating. And so instead of just immediately colliding, um, the Philistines put forth their strongest most powerful, intimidating man, which is Goliath, and asked the Israelites to do the same. And so David steps into this situation in the text that we just read. So let's talk about tonight two human hindrances that we must overcome, and we overcome them by remembering the cause. There are certain things that hinder our leadership. They would be human kind of uh, friction or resistance to our influence and testimony that, that the cause of God helps us to overcome um, these sources of hindrance. All right, number one, let's spend a few minutes uh, in the chapter that we began with, the hindrance of human opinion. The hindrance of human opinion. Did you see that romaine lettuce took a bit of a hit this past week? Um, if you ate salad at your family gathering, your family may not love you as, if you missed that story. Um, you're supposed to throw it all out, and it's amazing to me how um, people get all worked up. I'm not saying you should have kept it. I'm just saying I'm amazed how quickly uh, something is spread or something is verified or even proposed and everybody abandons or everybody discards something that is shared by another. Um, the other day I heard someone say this in reference that I've been avoiding salad for years. Now who's laughing? Ha ha ha, you know? Yeah. See, I was right all along. It's healthier to avoid salads. Uh, but I think oftentimes we avoid things in our leadership simply because of the opinion or perception of another. Now, I don't know if you thought about this, but if you were to do an exit interview with David of what discouraged him the most in this chapter, I don't know if it was Goliath. Long before he ever got to Goliath, he had to get past the opinions and the hindrances of those that should have been his allies. You find that in your leadership? Those that should be with you often provide the greatest source of discouragement. So a leader has to remember the cause to persevere through those seasons of difficulty or resistance or opinion from often places that greatly discourage us. Let me give you two ways in which the divine cause helps us to overcome some things in the area of opinion. Number one, first of all, I need to allow the divine cause to help us overcome opinionated criticism. Opinionated criticism. If you will, go back to the text and look at verse uh, 23. I'm sorry, verse 24. So they all flee, they're sore afraid, verse 25, and the men of Israel said, have you seen this man to David um, that has come up? Surely to defy Israel as he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter, make his father's house free in Israel. David spake to the man that stood by him, saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Now notice verse 28. And Eliab, the, his eldest brother, this would be David's eldest brother that remember um, Samuel saw and thought he was to be the next anointed king. When he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And so we see that David has to overcome some criticism uh, before he can accomplish all that God has called him to accomplish. Let me give you two areas in which we receive criticism through the opinion of others that we have to focus on the cause to overcome. Number one, criticism with anger. You see that Eliab, it says there, his anger was kindled against David. Um, why Eliab was angry with his brother, I'm not sure, but I could suppose that it was probably out of jealousy or who is this young upstart in the family. In fact, you see that Eliab in this text belittles David's age. 
his task and what I find hilarious as a brother, how many sheep he oversees. How petty. Did you notice that? How few your flock is. Isn't that typical family dynamics? And you don't even, you're in charge of sheep and there's not even very many of them. That's kind of the tone of Eliab toward his brother and this anger um, that oozes out of him toward uh, this sincere young man trying to be what God wanted him to be. I just remind you this evening that a leader consumed with the cause of God will always bring conviction in the hearts of those who are not about that cause. And I believe you see in a lie of the, the challenge that's before him as his brother brings to bear the right spirit and commitment to God, and it brings and cuts deeply the conviction into his heart. And so don't allow others who know you best to belittle your desire to be a part of God's big plan. Um, stick with it. Stay with it. Don't allow their criticism with anger um, to dissuade you. All right, notice the end of verse 28. He says this, Why camest thou hither, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? There's the, the condescension. I no, notice this, I know thy pride, the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Number two, not only criticism with anger, but criticism of motives. Criticism of motives. Have you ever had your motives questioned? You're even doing the right thing? but someone else seeks to hinder you or discourage you by questioning your motives. A week ago, we had baptisms at the uh, baptism service at the Days Inn, um, not today, but last Sunday. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but there was a gentleman with his, I think it was his son or family member that were in the pool when we first got there. I don't know if you saw him or not. And then they kind of got displaced by the crowd to the hot tub in the back so I wanted to make sure that I talked to him. Just, you know, I tried to do that if someone's in there. And, and first, just to thank him for maybe vacating the pool or putting up with, you know, 100 people watching them swim until they finally just say, I've had it and walk out or whatever. Um, but it was interesting as I was talking with him, he actually is a veteran. He's stationed in Alaska. He's back just for a few weeks with his family here. And so we were talking, and, and I, my goal in talking to him, and so I, I said, man, today's Veterans Day. Uh, Veterans Day, just want to thank you for your service. We had a very amicable relationship or uh, conversation, but I, I wanted to make sure he knew why we were there, and it gave me a chance to share the gospel, and here's what these folks have done and why, trying to just convey why we're there, because what's this group doing, and what did you just do in the pool, trying to explain why we were doing what we were doing. Can I just say, sometimes we do that, and still people misunderstand us. They question our motives. Why are you getting more committed in church? Why are you trying to take the next step in your walk with the Lord? Why are you now serving in church? You come to church on Sunday nights. What's the deal with that? And so a question of our motives, and as a leader, we must be poised and prepared for those approaches. To attempt to take on a great challenge will always provoke a pretender who is in leadership to question your motives. You have to be prepared for that, not be shocked by it. And we see David having to navigate that same challenge. Don't allow the accusations of being naive or insincere to keep you from believing in the cause of God. I have that all the time. You mean, you really think God can grow your church in this day and you think you can send out missionaries and start other churches? Yeah, I think God can do something. I, I still believe that. It may seem naive to you, but I have faith in God. So we, we have to keep that fresh in our hearts as a spirit-led believer. All right, now notice how David responds to that. Instead of engaging Eliab in a defensive way, Notice what he does very skillfully in verses 29 through 31. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. The people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. The idea in verse 29, it, to put it kind of in our words, he's saying, what's the harm in asking? What about the cause? And Eliab realizes he cannot stop David from continuing to ask that question, and the question ultimately led him back into the court, into the presence of Saul. Now, just a thought tonight that I've been working through in my own life. I've been trying to figure out why do people critique those who are just trying to do right? Why is that? And especially not from, I'm not talking from the heathens, I'm talking from believers who just resent someone trying to do honestly something great for God, something even simple for God. And I think I maybe have stumbled across the answer kind of in an unlikely place, but I wanted to show you this quote. This is amazing. I don't know if I've thought of this before. Um, 
author said this, Gladwell said this, quote, speaking of those who hinder or resent those in leadership, he says, quote, they were not really afraid, they were just afraid of being afraid. Now, that's a deep thought. I want you to think about that for a minute. Most people actually don't get into worrisome situations where they're actually scared. They're scared to ever get in a situation where they are scared. And when they see someone willing to push the envelope, someone willing to step out, literally step out on God's promises, it, it just it, it makes them nervous. It makes them afraid to even be afraid. And so I think the fear you see earlier in this text is now manifesting itself through the criticism of Eliab and others. Who do you think you are? Because they were afraid of even being afraid. And I think a lot of the criticism that we have is nothing personal. It's just seen as a threat. It's seen as something that brings discomfort to someone else, and we must see it at face value for what it is. All right, number two, if you will, go back to our text to verse 32. And I love how this story unfolds as God's plan is unveiled, and he chooses a man to represent him in this battle. Look at verse 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go. And fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Number two, allow the divine cause to overcome not only the opinionated um, cons- uh, criticisms, but number two, the opinionated doubts, those who doubt us. The cause of God helps us to push through those conversations and relationships that bring doubt uh, to bear. Can I give you two of them that are found, <laughs> found here, two manifestations of, of these doubts that are overcome as we focus upon the cause? Number one, jot this down, David is doubted, and we are doubted in the area of experience. When you see that in verse 32 and following, Saul says, Thou art not able to go, thou art but a youth. He is a man of war from his youth. He has experience that you do not have. Doubts in the area of experience. David tells uh, Saul, don't, fi- don't let your heart fail, don't worry, I will do uh, the task, and yet you see this dismissiveness on the part of King Saul. All right, let's go on, verse 34. And David said unto Saul, thy servant, notice this, kept his father's sheep. There came a lamb and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So you see verses 34 through 37, that David trusts in a God who had proved in himself in the past, just that God had helped him with these other animals these ferocious animals, God would help him in the battle that was before him. I have found one of the ways that I'm able to counter the doubts others sometimes direct at me as a leader is to remind myself not of what they see, but what I have seen with God in days gone by, how he has proven himself. One of the things that I love about all of us in this room is we have a past with God. We have a history with God. We have a history that shows that God is able. God is powerful. David reviews that and for the first time allows Saul into this experience from which he draws great confidence. I was reading an article the other day about a lady named Athena Chavaria who worked for many years as an executive assistant for Facebook. She, as of the writing this article a few months ago, does not allow her children to have cell phones until they're in high school, boo, all the teenagers would say, and even now severely limits their usage. She said this, She lives by the mantra, the last child in a class to get a personal phone wins. Just food for thought tonight as you navigate all that in your life. I'm right on the cusp of much of that. And as I was thinking about that story, isn't it amazing how people, until they post it, it it didn't really happen. Have you noticed that? Pictures we post, places we go, it's almost like until I post it, it, it's not even real. It's not even substantive. Saul, I think, would have been Mr. Selfie King, okay? He would have posted, hey, look at me and how I took out the Amalekites, how I did all these things and and, and all that I've sacrificed to God. David, on the other hand, had a very private relationship with God, one that moored his soul, one that strengthened his faith in God. Let them doubt, let them question. I've experienced God in a personal and powerful way. 
I may I just remind you this, this evening, dear leader, your experience with God does not have to be public to count for the cause of God. It can be just you and God, and God's proved himself to you. He's answered prayer. He's, he's done something. He's delivered you. Allow that to answer the doubts of others. Allow that to sustain you in the cause that God has called you to. In the, on the heels of Thanksgiving, I thought this was a great thought. Someone said this, thankfulness is worry's weakness. Thankfulness is worry's weakness. And as we review what God has done for us and we have gratitude, we have nothing to worry about, do we? It doesn't matter what you say. I've seen what God can do. I've experienced his power in my life. David exudes confidence because he does have experience, not in a public manner, not in a battle manner, but with God, he had seen what God could do. All right, verse 38. All right, so all of this is done. Saul at the end of the verse says, okay, we have no other options, so go, and the Lord be with thee. Verse 38. And, David, and Saul armed David with his armor and put a an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, or was determined, or began to go, for he had not proved it. He had not proved it. David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. Secondly, number two, not only are we often doubted in our areas of experience, number two, we're doubted in the area of weaponry. We're doubted in the area of weaponry, what we will bring to bear in battle. Now, I have seen often it portrayed in children's uh, illustrations, books or Bibles or whatever, that David is this wee little guy, and he's like just lost. You can't, he's swimming in Saul's armor. You see no indication of size being an issue. I don't know that David was as small as we would visualize in our mind. Now, we'll get to Goliath's size in just a moment, which any average guy would be small in comparison. But the main issue for David was it was not weaponry that he was comfortable using. God often does not use what is orthodox when it comes to weaponry. He doesn't lead out in a new direction with the orthodox approach. He doesn't use what others would deem acceptable or appropriate. He often use the, uses the unorthodox, and leaders need to be open to that. Leaders need to be open to what God would have used. And you notice what he chooses instead, <laughs> excuse me, in verse 40. He took his staff in hand, chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And so we see him choosing a staff, we see him choosing stones, and we see him choosing a sling. Now, the question often I hear is, why five stones? Why did he pick five? Um, can I give you maybe a thought? Some of you maybe are familiar with the answer. Would you go to 2 Samuel for just a moment? Why did he pick five? What, was it a lack of faith? Was it, well, one out of five at least I can hit um, this threat that's before me and is attacking and assaulting our God? 2 Samuel 21, we have time to look at the whole second half of this chapter, but just look, if you will, at the last couple of verses. 2 Samuel 21, why did David pick five smooth stones? Here might be a little bit of a window into his mindset as he approached um, this imposing man, uh, Goliath. 2 Samuel 21, look if you will at verse 22. <clears throat> and beginning in verse 15, we'll not read it for sake of time, but you have some of David's mighty man, men engaging some of the Philistines in battle. And in verse 22, to kind of summarize the previous verses, verses 15 through 21, it says this, These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Now, isn't that interesting that there are four of them, and obviously Goliath back in our chapter we began with in 1 Samuel 17. What you may not realize is that in this culture, it was, it was traditional for the offspring to avenge the death of the father. Um, David is a well-educated man. He is, he's through his interaction with court and politics and things and his association with Saul and with Jonathan, probably well aware of this law or this tradition as well as how many sons Goliath had. And so it's interesting that there were four sons. And so it's possible that David, when he ran toward the army, he wasn't just thinking about Goliath. He was thinking about the four sons behind Goliath that would shortly be those he would engage with. And you see him later on, God gives him, now that he's the king, his mighty men along with him attack and assault and defeat these other sons of Goliath. 
Um, but you see his desire to engage the enemy and to do so literally to take on five giants, not just one, but possibly five with a slingshot, a staff, and five stones. Uh, what tremendous faith, what tremendous focus uh, as he trusted what he had proven between him and the Lord. The stones were good enough for the bear. The stones were good enough for the lion. If God can use them in those situations, he can use them to this great threat that was before him. Um, I saw a, a clip the other day that I think I just think it captures the mindset of our day in leadership. Video is of a guy. Um, he's got tattoos. He's a young guy, got a beard. Nothing against necessarily tattoos or beards, obviously. But any, tattoos maybe, but not beards. Anyway, but he's got all these dumbbells stacked up. So, you know, like the ones you do curls with, like independent weights. He's got them stacked on top of each other, like dumbbells end, end on end, and then stacked up like about 10 feet. And he's got a platform, and he gets up on top of it, and it like puts himself head down, and he's doing push-ups on top of these dumbbells, like balancing himself. What's hilarious is the whole time he's doing this, like he's got this video feed, there's an older gentleman behind him at the other end of the gym with his back to this guy, not even paying attention to this amazing thing this guy's doing, just stroking free throws, just at the free throw line, just keeps making free throws, just doesn't pay attention to this young upstart and all he's doing. And somebody put this caption to the video. They said this, the guy in the front is a preacher who is desperate to entertain every week. The guy in the back is a preacher who just faithfully teaches, preaches God's word every week. I just thought that was, not that that's actually what the video was about, but it's almost like we view leadership as we got to have some wow factor. What about just being faithful with what God's given us? Trusting it, trusting his word, trusting his spirit. It's enough. No matter what anybody says or how they respond to it, may we lead with confidence where others are doubting our weaponry. Listen, the Bible is still good enough. It's, it's the best weapon God has given. It is the sword, prayer, the spirit, all these things God has given us. Trust them. Lead despite the critics. The way to be a part of a big victory for the cause of God rarely involves some new flashy technique or technology. It's just faithfully sticking by the tried and true ways that God has revealed to us. Now, we're going to get to the specifics, but David began alone. Did he not? Nobody believed in him. Nobody stood with him. Even Goliath, the big Goliath that was before him, had an armor bearer. David was alone. Are you willing to be that? Are you willing to be that kind of leader because of the cause of Jesus Christ? All right, what's the second hindrance that David had to overcome that he did so by focusing on the cause that we should as well. Go back to our text in 17 of 1 Samuel, and let's look at verse number 4. All right, let's go back. Let's rewind just a moment to kind of set the context for now this engagement, this dialogue, and the defeat of Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, and let's begin in verse number 4. <clears throat> and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He goes on to describe him. He had a helmet of brass upon his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. He had greaves of brass upon his legs, target of brass between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went out before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye the servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then will we be your servants? But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. The second thing that a focus upon the cause of God helps us to overcome, number one, the human um, opinion. Number two, the human advantage, the hindrance of human advantage. And I would give you two ways that the divine cause helps us to overcome these advantages. Number one, allow the divine cause to overcome advantage size, the advantage of size. And we see two areas in which De uh, Goliath had the size advantage uh, over David. Number one, size of profile, his size of profile, his physical uh, profile was greater than that of David. Um, in basketball nowadays, they refer to, it used to be they were called post or centers, but they refer now to the larger players on a basketball court as the bigs. Um, and I was reading an article a few weeks ago that was talking about the largest 
are the tallest players ever to play in the NBA. Uh, there are two of them, Manute Bull, you may remember him, I remember him, big, tall, lean guy, um, and then George Mursan, uh, both were seven foot seven, the tallest players in NBA history. To give you context, Goliath, if you look back at the text, go back to verse number four, it says his height was six cubits in a span. A cubit in scripture typically refers to, and I know it's a bit subjective on the size of the man, but from the tip of the finger to the elbow is what we're referring to as a cubit. So it would vary just a bit based on the man measuring, but it was kind of a rule of thumb, if you will, that tip of finger to elbow was a cubit, which is about 18 inches for the average man. So this man, if you do the math, a cubit, if it equals 18 inches and a span is about nine inches, then that means Goliath was nine feet, nine inches tall, nine feet, nine inches. And I was trying to, I wanted to show you a graphic tonight next to me of how tall I'm six, one in a, a very strong half. Okay. That's what I am. And Goliath would exceed that by over three feet, massive guy. Um, and, uh, his size obviously would have been imposing to say the least, and yet we see David looking past the size to something greater that sustained him through this interaction. Also, just to give you a point of reference of not just his height, he probably was a bit stockier than Manute Bull from what I remember of his profile. Uh, it talks about he has a bronze helmet, a coat of scale, uh, scale armor weighing 5,000 shekels. That would be about 125 pounds. Uh, he's armed with a bronze javelin. Uh, and just the tip of that javelin would have weighed 15 pounds, just the very tip of it. So massive uh, armament that this man had on him that he easily carried into battle. Um, can I just say this by way of application in the area of size or profile of our enemy that often intimidates us? Those who lead for God look past that posturing. They look past those props and they see what God can do. They anticipate that God can take on any enemy, no matter how large. By the way, big profiles attempt to win. This is key tonight. Big profiles tend to try to win in the perception realm. Goliath was trying to win without ever raising his spirit. He was trying to intimidate. Do you know the greatest asset of those who possess a greater size? The problem that you're most scared of this evening, the thing that intimidates you most about life and your walk with Christ and your leadership is not substantive, it is perception. And what Goliath was relying upon is he was trying to put out this perception that would intimidate and overwhelm the Israelites and they would cave and they would surrender long before the spear was raised. And so those who battle and those who engage for the cause look past that perception and see what God could do if they're willing to engage in battle. It's very likely, just a thought, it's very likely that Goliath himself had not been involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat for years. His sheer size and mass won the day. He, he never had to engage. His size alone would intimidate the enemy. So can I encourage you this evening, a leader looks past the props, a leader looks past the profile and sees the potential of what God can do if we will see through the engagement period to give God a chance to work in that otherwise sizable challenge. All right, not only did he have some physical profile that would have been a bit sizably uh, to his advantage, go to verse 41. All right, later on we see now this interaction between David probably a guy um, of average height of that day, whereas we see this Philistine towering above him. And notice a second, a second area in which he was disadvantaged, David was, inside. Verse 41, the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. Or his shield was so big that a guy, that was his job, was literally just to move the shield. Uh, verse 42, and when the Philistines looked about and saw David, it's almost like he looked around like this and then looked down. That's at least what's in my mind. He looked about and then, oh yeah, there's somebody beneath me here. And saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistines said unto David, am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves or sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. Verse 44, and the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh and the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. So we see size first in profile. Number two, jot this down, size in ego. Size in ego. David did not have a large ego. David did not have a, a, a profile that was intimidating. He was not arrogant. And yet we see the size of the ego of this man that God is about 
to reduce. Now, because man looks on the outward appearance, remember we talked about that a few weeks ago with David when Samuel came and he anoints David when God says to him, man looks on the outward, God looks on the heart. If man looks on the outward, then what that means is for those of us who are the least, from man's perspective, possess the greatest opportunity for God to get glory. The disparity between David and Goliath actually created a margin in which God's glory could be manifest. That if Israel had a Goliath equal in weight and ego and experience, God couldn't get the glory he could get as he is about to do in the text. So David was uniquely qualified to counter this ego, to, to point the attention not at himself, but at the God who was about to bring victory. And you will notice in verse 43 that we just read that the Philistine cursed David by his gods. This was not a battle between David and Goliath, was it? Uh, you have to know this as a leader. I find often as a leader it's very tempting to engage where it's me versus them or them versus me instead of this is my God, if I'm being faithful to his cause, versus the gods that are deceiving or misdirecting this individual or in this situation. And so it's a war of gods. It's a collision of deities. And leaders see that, and leaders see past all of the posturing and the ego and the arrogance of the enemy um, that is around us. Those who lead, even when, it, when they're at a human disadvantage, recognize that the true enemy is spiritual, and that ultimately it, the attack is not against them, but it is against the Lord. Uh, I think we have time. Go to Ephesians for just a moment. Let's bring this into the New Testament context. Ephesians 6. Probably you thought of these verses, but let's look at them for just a moment. Ephesians chapter 6, and let's look at verse uh, number um, 10. Ephesians 6, let's begin in verse 10. He says this, this is Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus, and admonition to us as a local New Testament as well, uh, church as well. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, here it is. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now, just a thought before we move on. Ultimately, the size, I'm sorry, ultimately, Goliath's strength was derived by everyone in this story until David, their focus on flesh. Is that not true? Goliath's strength came from the fact that Saul and everybody else with him cowering in the tents, and even the Philistines on the other side of the valley, the reason he had his imposing power and presence was because everybody in that valley was focused on what they could see and their evaluation of that flesh. Whereas David saw something different. As a leader, he saw the spiritual world. He saw the battle that was about to be fought in which God in the spiritual realm always wins. And so his strength was only derived from the focus of everyone upon flesh. What if you as a leader got your focus off the flesh? That fleshly things are the enemy? That fleshly things are the way to fix what is the enemy or to defeat the enemy? What if our resource, what if our victory came as we focus more upon the spirit? Without the cause of God dominating your focus, you will over time allow the critics, the haters to define and limit your leadership potential. David saw more because he saw more than just what he could see. Ultimately, the size of Goliath from David's perspective made him unmissable. That's how he saw it. He's so big, I can't miss. Um, and I think sometimes in our lives, we see the, the big targets. We see the, the big things and we view them as a threat. We view them as the bigger they are, uh, the more imposing they are. What if the bigger they are, the easier they are to hit and to defeat through the name of our God? And so that's the perspective we need as a leader, the hindrance of human advantage. All right, number two, go to verse 45. And just to warn you, the end of this story is a bit graphic. You know that, right? But I think that's good because it provides for us a clear, distinct picture of what God can defeat. Verse 45. Then said David the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now, I read that calmly, but I guarantee David, I don't know how he said it, 
I don't know if he said it with bated breath. I don't know if he screamed at the top of his lungs. I don't know if he thought, man, I'm outrunning my coverage here, but here we go. I'm going to say this anyway. I'm going to exude confidence. But he, he speaks, and he speaks with clarity. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. All right, This isn't we're going to negotiate a business agreement here. And I will give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day and the fowls of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in heaven. Number two, so we allow the divine cause to help us overcome the advantage of size. Number two, we allow the divine cause to overcome the advantage of knowledge. The advantage of knowledge. And you see that emphasis upon no, no, no in the text. K-N-O-W. I don't know if you're like me, does your brain ever scare you how forgetful it is, how um, often its perception is off? Um, Heidi and I were having a conversation the other night. She was talking about, I just can't remember what the name of things are. Um, And I said, well, give me an example. She said, well, you know those round orange things that we have on our porches around this time? I'm like, you mean a pumpkin? She's like, yeah, that's it, a pumpkin. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You can't remember a pumpkin? So I was kind of laughing at her. Then uh, on Black Friday, I was out of the store uh, sitting, I, I had backed my car in, and there was a car beside me. I could tell he was about to leave, so I backed in. And as I was backing in, I don't know if you've ever had where your 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 sense of the situation is off, and then you interpret the data or sensory things around you wrongly. He started to back out, but it felt like my car was still moving, so I had the brake applied. But it, as he was backing out, I felt, um, uh, "What's going on?" You know, my brain just playing tricks on me. It's scary how often our brains let us down or misinterpret a situation. I think in this situation, not only did David feel like he was at a disadvantage on the brawn front, he probably also felt like he was a bit at a disadvantage on the brains front. He didn't know this situation the way Goliath did. He had never been in this situation before. And yet God ultimately is going to prove himself despite the ignorance or the limited knowledge that David possessed. A leader, listen to me, doesn't have to know everything. A leader just has to be willing to trust God in every situation. You don't have to know it all. You just have to trust God. You have to believe that God will reveal his will. God will prove himself. And we see that optimism. We see that faith in the heart and lips of David. By the way, where did the stone hit this man, Goliath? The forehead, right? Emphasizes that. The head, the forehead, the face. And I believe God proved himself in this situation. Despite the experience up here of Goliath, David's faith proved uh, to be superior. All right, let's give you a couple things that knowledge, that helps us in the area of knowledge when we focus on the cause. Number one, knowledge of battle. Knowledge of battle. In verses 45 through 47, you see David emphasizing knowledge. The end of verse 46, that all the earth may know that there is a God in heaven. Notice the beginning of verse 47, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. He didn't know battle as well as Goliath, but God was about to reveal what David already knew, that God was superior, that God would bring victory in this situation. Can you imagine the Israelites watching David take off toward Goliath and seeing this young, this youth with all of his inexperience going by faith toward Goliath. Um, What innocence, what sincerity, and yet from their perspective, what ignorance. Yet David was proven, David was affirmed through God's power in the story. All right, verse 47, we read that verse. It says that uh, that all the assemblies shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands faith that's there. Go back to 14 of 1 Samuel. We talked about this earlier with Jonathan, but it's kind of the same feel as Jonathan. Remember that with the Philistine garrison? Go back to chapter 14 for just a moment and verse 6. This is how a leader thinks. It's how a leader is consumed with the cause of God, and he can persevere when he feels that he's at a disadvantage on the knowledge front. 1 Samuel 14, verse 6. Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over on the garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be the Lord will work for us. Notice the end of the verse. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And so this same spirit of faith in God, that God can prove himself in a difficult situation. Leaders know that God's deliverance is just as viable when his people are at a human disadvantage. In fact, that is when he is most likely to show up. That's when he's most likely to prove himself. 
David fought that all the earth may know that there is a God and that he is worthy of worship. Um, I read an article the other day. The author said this. I thought this was a good question for us in our community and in our church. He said, are you the kind of person, and is your church the kind of church about which others in your community may say the following? Quote, I don't share their beliefs, but I shudder to think about what this city would be without them. Are there things happening in our church or things happening in our lives that without them, others would not sense or see what God can do? They wouldn't know our God. They wouldn't have faith in our God. David allowed others to know who truly God was. The Goliath of this chapter is mocking that God. David wants to make sure that he is getting glory through this situation. All right, lastly, look at verse 48, my favorite part of the story. Rather gruesome. <laughs> but I think very significant in how God redeems this situation. Look at verse 48. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. I love this part. That David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Don't forget that. He's not just running toward Goliath. He's running toward the backdrop of, of the, the armies of Philistia. Um, he, is, he is engaging. He is initiating um, in this situation. I was showing Heidi a video, um, I think the boys too. Um, did any of you watch the National Dog Show? Was that on like on Thanksgiving Day or the next day or whatever? Our, our, our house is slowly going to the dogs, if you know what I mean. We have a dog, now we watch the dog show. But anyway, there was a clip in that of a man, the ju- you know how they judge dogs? It's the most, I, I, it's fascinating but weird and whenever I watch it. And they're judging the dogs and there was a guy holding, did you see this? This little black dog and the judge is having the guy do whatever the dog... And the guy, the, the owner or the trainer, had a, a treat in his hand to kind of keep the dog's attention. And video footage caught that after the judge turned his head, the guy who had been holding the treat, instead of giving it to the dog, he ate it. He ate the treat. And it, I mean, this is on national TV. Like, that's so weird on so many levels. You know, I don't know what to say. It was just kind of one of those cringe moments. You know, with David, how was he so light footed in verse 48? He wasn't thinking about himself. He wasn't thinking about preserving his position. He wasn't thinking about his own survival. He was thinking about one thing. And it goes back to verse 29. Is there not a cause? And that cause is not self-preservation. It's not what I'm going to get out of this. It's the cause of God. Leaders are light on their feet because it's about the cause of God. It's not about their survival or protecting their position or their profile. David was uh, eager to see the cause of God advanced. Lose your self-preservation and over-analysis and just engage the enemy for the glory of God when God prompts you to do so. All right, verse 49. So he he runs toward this man, and David put his hand in his bag and took took thence a stone and slang it. He smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. Um, and hopefully you know this, but it's very likely that the stone to the forehead did not kill Goliath. What we're going to get to in just a moment for sure did, if he wasn't dead in verse 49. But it stunned him, it dropped him, he was hit in the head and then uh, fell face forward, as you see in the text. And David, uh, with God's sovereignty and God's plan, brought that stone to bear exactly where it needed to be. Now, David was probably skilled, but I bet God, I would guess that God was also involved in the trajectory of that stone. It went exactly in the the vulnerable place in this man's helmet and brought him uh, down upon his face. Uh, I think there's arrogance that's clearly given here. You see the Philistine, he hasn't even raised his spear. He's, he's, I think, a bit apathetic, and David engages the enemy, and God helps him to triumph as he's engaged in the cause. While the enemy is getting ahead of themselves and counting their victories before they're accomplished, God's cause calls us to do something, to engage the enemy. And we see David doing that. Now, what happens? All right, he's dropped him. Verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. I love that the scripture includes again what he overcame him with, a sling and a stone. Smote the Philistine and slew him. Notice, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him. And cut off his head therewith, and when the Philistines saw their champion dead, 
they fled. And here's the imagery in my mind. I don't know if this is exactly how it played out, but I, I see David struggling to get on top of Goliath, to climb on top, to pull out this massive sword that we see referenced later when David is king. Um, he pulls out the sword, and it's very likely the sword was large enough that all he had to do was get it up and then let it drop. But after beheading Goliath, sorry for the graphicness, I believe that David took that head, stuck it up. The head that had been the source of all, he had the knowledge there. He was the experienced fighter. He had all the wherewithal. He was going to win this Goliath. David took that and made it a trophy of what God can do. Do you as a leader have that kind of trophy? Do I have that kind of trophy? It may not be literally a head in the case we're talking about, but an evidence of what God can do. David became the, the poster child. This head became the evidence of God's cause being the winning cause. And so we see God getting glory uh, through this situation. What began as a tool of intimidation by the Philistines quickly became a trophy of intimidation for the otherwise abstract God of heaven. Here's basically what happened. God had been abstract before this moment. Sure, there's a Jehovah God. Sure, he did things in the past. But this moment showed what God could do. This moment showed that God was not just irrelevant or antiquated or whatever. He was able to bring his power to bear in this situation. While Goliath is measurable and tangible, we see our God who can be reduced to abstract now through a singular leader consumed with the cause of God become tangible and evident, irrefutable before the eyes of even the heathen. All right, look, if you will, at what happens in verse 52. And this is the heart of our study today. Look at verse 52. All of that's really neat and a review of a story most of us know well. But look at verse 52. All right, so the Philistines flee. And notice what happens in verse 52. Because of a man consumed with the cause of God. And the man of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until I come to the valley to the gates of Ekron. And the wound of the Philistines fell down by the way of Shariah even unto Gath and unto Ekron, and the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. Now, these are the same guys that earlier in the chapter are cowering in their tents, correct? What changed? Did Goliath reduce in size? Did he lose all of his wherewithal? Did somehow somebody took his armor or whatever? No, what changed? One guy, consumed with the cause of God. Saul had all the power, Saul had all the position, but who's the leader in 1 Samuel 17? It's David. David, not because he had more and could do more, but because he believed in and was consumed with the cause of God. Saul was protecting his position. David was advancing the cause of God. That's a leader. And tonight we need God's help to be that leader for those that he's called us to influence. I wanted to show you a couple of pictures. This is a story, I don't know if you saw it out of Utah about a week and a half ago, about a man named Brent Taylor. Um, <clears throat> and this is just three pictures here that kind of show the sequence. Um, I'll show you the pictures and then tell you the story behind it. So there's a picture. Um, they're taking this large uh, tarp-covered uh, uh, item to the top of a hill there in Utah. And here's the picture of what they put up. You can see kind of the mountain range behind it. And then see the flag down there at the bottom? Good. That's good. Thank you. Somebody's with me. That's good. All right. Uh, but thank you, buddy. The, uh, this, uh, this is a picture of, about a man named Brent Taylor. I don't know if you saw this, but he was the mayor of a small town in Utah, uh, Ogden, uh, Utah, who uh, he retired from being a mayor. He was in the um, armed forces, specifically in the reserves. And uh, about a week and a half ago, he lost his life in service to uh, our country. And uh, so some of his friends and folks from this region, they uh, climbed up this hill, and uh, he is a member of the Army National Guard, had just died um, on November 3rd, actually, so a couple of weeks ago, and they put this flag up as kind of a testimony. It's a quarter of an acre in size. It's a massive flag, and one of the guys they were interviewing said um, that uh, Brent just, he did big things, and so we felt like this was an appropriate tribute to him as well as to comfort his family. I saw an interview with his widow um, and uh, just the strength of their family. But the story is told that after he got to uh, Afghanistan, had been there for some time, he was actually killed, uh, at least last report I saw, at the hands of a member of the Afghani special forces that he was actually helping to train. They turned on him. Did you see that story? Um, but they were stressing he loved America. 
He loved the cause. He loved our freedoms. He loved who we were and what we stand for as a country, and he died uh, for that cause. May I just remind you this evening that fear will never lead us to a good place as a leader. Fear of preservation, fear of defensiveness, whereas faith in a cause will lead us to victory and others that follow along behind us. And all it takes for God's people, listen to me, all it takes for God's people to focus not on the Goliath but on the God is one person that remembers that cause, one person that commits to that cause. What could God do if you became that leader in your areas of influence? Let's end tonight in Psalm 64. Would you turn there for just a moment and let's look at verse 1 and following. David penned these words sometime after the story we just read. But Psalm 64, look, if you will, at a couple of verses in this short psalm. Psalm 64. The Bible says this, and this, I think, soothes us and comforts us when we lead, despite the human advantages of others, the human opinion of others. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity who wet their tongue like a sword, notice that phrase, we'll come back to that toward the end, and bend their bows to shoot their (coughs) arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter, matter. They commune of laying snares privily. They say, who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search, both the inward thought of every one of them, and the heart is deep. Notice verse 7, but God... But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. I love this next phrase. So shall they make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. That's a great phrase there. I love that. All that see them shall flee away, and all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. You see the commitment of David to God and to God's cause, and he allows God to be his defense. He allows God to be the one who protects him from the enemy. Here's the question as we finish tonight. I'd like you to think about it. Will you become more of a cause-driven leader? Because if you don't, here's two things that will take you out. Number one, human opinion. As a leader, I've come to terms with that. Not everybody's going to understand. Not everybody's going to appreciate. Not everybody's going to agree. If my leading is defined by what others think of me, I will not persevere in leadership. Same thing is true with human advantage. Well, we're looking at the numbers, and there's no way that we can accomplish this. There's no way that we can move forward in this area. Are we willing to lead despite being at a disadvantage, in spite of others and what they think of us? That's a leader. And the only way to persevere through those difficulties and resistance is to do so with the cause of God. Is they're not a cause. And my prayer is that God will raise up David's in our midst, starting with me, that I will lead like David did. Take on the Goliaths and the sons of the Goliaths and make sure that I'm faithful until God calls me home. And would you be willing to do the same, not just for your benefit, but for the army behind you that's lost their nerve, the people that have forgotten or are unwilling to engage with the enemy, that if you would just stand, maybe they would do the same. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight.